When I first arrived at Langley, back during World War II, I was assigned to the branch that included the eight-foot high-speed tunnel. It wasn't a transonic tunnel in those days. And John Stack was in charge. Of course, working for John Stack was an experience, but that's not part of my story. Uh, the, what I learned immediately, a lot of confidential uh, information about the problems of high-speed flight. Things that I hadn't even heard about when I was back in school. About the compressibility burble, that's what they called it in those days. And all of the very severe drag stability and uh, control problems that you, we had at transonic speeds, low transonic speeds. And there was no way to predict these things. It was totally, uh, you couldn't calculate because it was totally mixed up flow. It, the big problem was that it was a mixture of part subsonic and part supersonic flow with a very large amount of separation thrown in. So in order to be able to figure out how to improve things, we had to understand the flow. Since there's no theory, we had to, what I did so immediately, very shortly after I got there was to say, let's go into the tunnel and study what's going on. We ran many tests that, show, that showed we had a problem, but why did we have the problem? Now the two-dimensional two airfoil test uh, showed us something about that case, but we knew very little about the three-dimensional case. At about the time I got there, or a couple of years after I got there, uh, the, uh, we got the data from the Germans on swept back wings, and also uh, R.T. Jones proposed swept back wings during that period. Here again was a case where the simple theory told us that we were going to get a lot out of the uh, swept back wing, but in reality, when we tested a, these various swept back wings, we didn't get anywhere near what the theory predicted. So we had to find out what was going on. And so throughout, uh, th this was the first case that I got involved with, but throughout the rest of the, the time that I worked at the tunnel, we were continually exploring the phenomena that was involved with transonic flight. It's only been in the last few years that we've gotten some of the theories that we need to allow us to rationally pr predict what's going to happen at transonic speeds. Now, the, I mentioned that the, the first thing that I got involved with was the swept back wing. I proposed that we study the flow around the swept back wing. And we used all of our available uh, flow measuring devices. The basic one is uh, surface pressure measurements. Also, we can determine where the drag's coming from by wake surveys. And also we can put, we, at that time, we put tufts on the surface to f uh, show uh, roughly what the boundary layer is doing. Now, from these results that I got on a series of wings, swept back and swept forward, we found out why the theory, uh, why the actual wing did not would act as well as the theory predicted. And it was due to the fact that the sweep of the shock wave on the upper surface of the wing was not as great as the sweep back of the wing. And therefore, it was just acting like a wing with lower sweep back. Over the years, the various people that uh, design airplanes have accounted for that by putting very severe variations in the section across the span to uh, keep the uh, shock wave with the same sweep as the wing has. Well, that isn't what I was, the, the thing that really uh, I came up with. At that particular point, I found from the wake surveys that when you, we surveyed the drag onset for this wing, that the, the drag, there was very little drag rise associated with the root. 
And this was due to a relieving effect of the fuselage on the airflow over the root sections of the wing. So I proposed at that point that we build wings with thick root sections to uh, uh, make the structure more, uh, the lighter, make it a lighter weight structure. I think you're all aware of the fact that the, there's a very severe bending moment in the wing which gets, becomes greater as you go towards the root. And by thickening the wing, we could o reduce the weight to overcome that bending moment. So we tested that, and indeed we could make the wing root thicker than for the, uh, than for the outer panels and get this uh, weight reduction. And I well, thought, geez, this is great. And then the chief of research at Boeing came in, and I happened to be there while he was uh, talking, and he said that Boeing had just discovered that you could make the wing root thicker and get uh, the weight reduction without a drag penalty. And so I was scooped on that idea, but at least we, I had demonstrated at that particular point that the way to make it advance in aerodynamics at transonic speeds was to understand what's going on. So, the, that led, uh, or the, uh, this whole uh, trend of uh, flight at transonic speeds continued on as we pushed up into the near sonic uh, range uh, with swept back wings and other in devices it became apparent that we were running into a barrier, that nothing we did was improving things near Mach 1. At that particular point, the people at uh, PARD, the fl uh, flight people, were testing vehicles through the speed of sound. And very shortly, we were going to actually test a flight vehicle with a man in it through the speed of sound. But the drag, at the speed of sound was extremely high. And it was much higher than any simple theory would predict. So again, it appeared that we needed to get some flow studies to understand what is going on. Now in this particular case, we, we did it with a new tunnel, a modification of the tunnel we had a true transonic tunnel, not one that went up close to the speed of sound, but one that went through the speed of sound. Now the development of the transonic tunnel will not be part of the story, but I just want to point out that we needed that tunnel to make the flow surveys. Well, we tested a typical swept wing body combination. And again, just as we'd done on the previous test, we used all of the available tools for determining the flow, that is pressure distributions, wake surveys, and an additional device now, a Schlieren system for visualizing the shock waves. Because near the speed of sound, the primary drag producer is a very powerful shock wave. Right near the speed of sound, we haven't yet developed two waves, we just have one wave. So when we had uh, made all these surveys and looking them over, we saw that there was a very fascinating thing happening. That the shock wave produced by the swept wing body combination looked very much like the shock wave for a body revolution. That is, it was symmetrical all the way around and it was very nearly normal. That is, even though the wing was swept back, the wave was normal back near the tip of the wing. The, the waves that were on the wing itself had disappeared and everything was concentrated in that one normal wave. So it's obvious that it's some, the, the wave is like that around a body of revolution. The question though is, what body of revolution? And here, uh, at this particular point, Boosman gave a lecture on the fundamentals of transonic flow. And he described transonic flow as 
pipe fitters flow. That uh, Boosman, as you know, had a very unique way of presenting many, many physical phenomena. And it was, it was a pipe fitter's flow. Now let's describe that. At subsonic speeds, when the air flows over a configuration, say a wing, it speeds up. And the, a tube of air going over the wing contracts by Bernoulli's principle. Because the same mass is uh, goes through a narrower region because it's, it's going faster. This is well-known fluid mechanics. At the speed of sound, the change in density of the air is exactly equal to the change in the velocity, and therefore, that is, the it, air is becoming less dense. We're now up in the compressible region. And in fact, this is why we get the speed of sound at that particular point. And so at this particular point, the, 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 because of the reduced density, the air does not contract, the, the tube of air doesn't contract because it's less dense. And in fact, it doesn't contract at all. At that particular point, a given tube of air going over a configuration stays at the same area and goes off the back end. It's just like a pipe, an ordinary plumbing pipe of air going over the wing. So now, this is the key, that since the air, the area of the tube is not changing, then the air, that tube of air pushes out on all the other tubes of air outside it and pushes with exactly the same amount of push as the original wing pushed on that first tube of air. There's no relief. And so, out at a distance, it's still the air is still being pushed with a piece of that cross-sectional area. And it doesn't make any difference whether it's being pushed by the fuselage or by the wing, because there has been no change in the push. So therefore, the, the flow around the configuration out of the distance must be proportional to the cross, uh, be a function of what's happening to the cross-sectional areas. In other words, the longitudinal distribution of cross-sectional areas. So this was the basis of the idea, that the, it was the shock waves with all its drag as a function of these areas. Now, <coughs> we proposed this at a meeting uh, at the, uh, here at Langley, and there was quite a bit of discussion on it. But the main thing was, at that particular point, it was merely a concept, and I didn't really want to call it anything really big, so I called it a rule of thumb. And that's where the term area rule came from because of that initial description of it is a rule of thumb. But we had to prove it, so we went back into the tunnel and tested a group of wing body combinations. Of course, basic, uh, you have to start with a basic body, then you have to add a wing to the body to get that. And we did it for three different kinds of wings. And then, in addition to that, we tested bodies with bumps on the fuselage that had cross-sectional areas that were the same as for the wing. And according to the area rule, the drag for those bumpy bodies should be the same as for the wing. The wave drag should be the same. But far more important, from a practical standpoint, if you indent the body, with the same cross-sectional area that the wing adds, then the wave drag for the wing should disappear. And we tested them, and essentially that happened. The, the, the bumpy bodies had the same drag rise, super, uh, shock wave drag rise, as did the wings. And the indented bodies, the wings with the indented bodies, had very little wave drag associated with the addition of the wing. With some left, five or 10 percent. But most of it was gone. Now, this is supposed to be a talk on the basic concepts and uh, the, how we arrived at these things, so I'm not going to go on and tell the rest of the story about the area rule, because that is uh, not part of the, the story. Now, that 
kept everybody busy for a while, but and we, as we penetrated into the supersonic range, we got involved with supersonic transports. And R.T. Jones mentioned the fact that uh, the, they're having trouble with the Concord. I think everybody knows that the Concord is uh, not commercially practical. But we, for a long while, we tried to develop a commercially practical supersonic transport here at Langley. And again, I was trying to develop things by understanding the nature of the flow and trying to work out the details for a, the configuration. We came up with a configuration that was pretty efficient, but we turned it over to the industry and the, uh, they said that it's, it's going to have uh, direct operating costs much higher than for subsonic airplanes, just as RT was describing. So I turned my back on SSTs and went back to see if I could do something more on subsonic flight, that is to make airplanes flying up at high subsonic speeds more efficient. And I was scratching my head. I, I had all this background, but nothing seemed to be coming to me until some people from LTV walked in. And they were testing Adam 2 which was a vertical takeoff Navy airplane, which uh, was intended, uh, as, it was a jet airplane, and therefore it was intended to fly level as a jet, and then divert the jet downward to get the, uh, the, the, the vertical takeoff. And they had a problem. Well, I might mention that when they were flying level, they turned the flap up, and there was a gap between the flap and the top of the nacelle for the engine. In other words, the flow was coming through and there was some, there was some flow over the, this flap at the trailing edge, a fairly small cord flap. It was back near about 80% cord. So the, the, their problem was they were in the wind tunnel and the drag rise for this thing was much better than for a, what they had predicted. They couldn't understand why this drag rise was so much delayed. And that had me stumped. And so I went back and started thinking about it. And it dawned on me that the flow through that slot was acting as a control on boundary layer separation, very similar to the way the flow through a slot on a wing at landing or takeoff helps on the maximum lift. Now, over the years, people had proposed that you blow on the boundary layer, that you suck on the boundary layer to reduce the boundary layer separation due to shock waves. But they'd always done it right up there where the shock wave was. But here was a case where the slot was way, way back behind the shock wave. How could that slot way back there help when the flow separation was obviously up there near the shock wave. I went back and dug out all the pictures, the slurring pictures we had on flow on airfoils. Usually when you uh, put out a report on the slurring pictures on airfoils, you show the more interesting ones on where the shock wave is pretty strong and you got a separation of the shock wave and sure enough the shock wave it starts right at the shock, uh, the, the, the boundary layer separation starts right at the shock wave. And so that's where everybody thought it occurred. But if you go back and look at the Schlieren pictures in the sequence earlier than that, to where they're gradually increasing the Mach number, the initial separation occurs at the trailing edge. And then it moves forward to the shock wave. Because the initial separation occurs because the boundary layer has to go through first the pressure recovery of the shock wave and then the pressure recovery behind the shock wave. And therefore the, that boundary layer is losing energy all the way and that's where it's going to separate first. Now put a slot in the system between the shock wave and the trailing edge and you have greatly improved the boundary layer flow at that point where the separation first occurs because you've got a fresh boundary layer behind the slot. So there is why it would 
work. That's why you could delay the onset of that separation, even though the slot was way rearward. Well, it looked pretty good to me. Now let's build an airfoil with a slot in it for transonic flight and greatly delay the onset of the separation. I might mention, I, I ought to bring in some uh, side issues here. Uh, you have to get approval for these things, and I had to go to Larry Laughlin and say, hey, let's build a model. And he says, let's go. So anyway, the, we built this model, and sure enough, the separation was greatly delayed. But the problem was that we now had pulled the shock wave because there was no separation to push the shock wave forward, the shock wave moved way rearward on the airfoil, and we got a very strong shock wave with a lot of shock wave losses. Again, we had been uh, were surveying just as we do all the time, and the uh, the surveys indicated a very strong shock wave. Is this the thing we push? Yes. Okay. At this particular point, I don't know whether we called it a supercritical airfoil, but uh, when I, at the point in my story, but we had to get rid of the, the, the strong shock wave. And so we decided that we'd make the upper surface, reduce the curvature of the upper surface. And there, therefore the flow wouldn't accelerate as much on the upper surface and the shock wave wouldn't be as strong. And so we arrived in an airfoil that looked like the one at the top. That was back in 1964. Now, this, uh, you, of course, uh, I ought to throw in that just an explanation that we've gotten rid of the camber on the main airfoil and we get the lift back by the very severe concavity of the flap behind the slot. That particular airfoil worked very nicely. We got over a tenth delay in drag rise compared to conventional airfoils. And I would like to point out here that on the basis of our Schlieren pictures that we had a shockless flow on that airfoil even though the shock wave was back near the 80% cord station. That we got in 1965. The, oh, now the problem with that airfoil was that it was too complicated. The, the industry said, gee, it's great. And they, a number of people tried to design wings with it. And they decided the slot, was, the slot had to be very accurate and it was too expensive. So we said, well, can we get rid of the slot? Again, going back into a study of the physical phenomena involved, or an evaluation of the physical phenomena, we came up with the idea that if you were to put a plateau in the pressure distribution behind the shock wave to let the boundary layer recover some energy by mixing before you pushed it through the final pressure recovery, then maybe we could get rid of the slot. Let that mixing region pour some energy into it. After all, you're familiar with the fact that vortex generators reduce and delay separation because they mix the high energy air into the low energy air. We could have put vortex generators there too. But I felt that everybody knows that vortex generators have a lot of drag. So what I said was, let's just give it a, a, a region to stabilize. And so we did that, and we found that we could get rid of the slot. And that was the next airfoil shown here. Again, a flat upper surface to get reduce the shock losses, and uh, the plateau to get rid of, uh, control the separation. Again, a very large amount of camber at the rear end to uh, get the lift back that we lost by flattening the upper surface. Now, throughout this point, uh, I, I mentioned that, at this, that throughout this work, we did not have a theory. And all of the development of the proper shape was done experimentally using the various tools we had, like pressure distributions. Uh, at about this time, after we'd gotten to the sl uh, unslotted airfoil, theories became available. I'd like to point out that they were, became available because Langley funded NYU with a very large contract to get 
a theory that would work at these transonic speeds. And it would take the best mathematicians in the country to do it because this was mixed flow, a mixture of trans, uh, subsonic and supersonics. And they did it. They came up with a very good theory, which beyond that point we used in our development of airfoil shapes. Now, one of the things that the industry complained about was that the thin trailing edge was impractical. And so we finally decided, all right, we'll thicken the trailing edge. And here we come to a very interesting point. Everybody knows you shouldn't have blunt bases. That, the, the industry, this was one of the hardest things that the industry had to accept. You know that there's got to be drag with a blunt base. And yet, on the supercritical airfoil, that blunt base has no additional drag. Because any airfoil that ever was designed and built or flown has some separation near the trailing edge. What it amounts to is that the boundary layer, as it moves towards the trailing edge, goes through a pressure recovery, and it cannot go all the way to a new stagnation point at the trailing edge, which theory says it should do. And therefore, there's a local separation of a couple of percent cord on almost every airfoil that flies, just to to account for the fact that you can't go into, uh, the boundary layer can't go into a stagnation point. Now, when you put a thick trailing edge on, then that separation on the upper surface disappears. It rolls around and falls in behind the trailing edge. Instead of being right up in the upper surface here, it's now behind the trailing edge. Same amount of separation, therefore the same amount of drag. But what we did get was, that was payoff, was a very large increase in lift. Because we added all the material on the lower surface, and therefore it was like a flap being deflected, and we got some more lift. And so we got a better L over D by using a thickened trailing edge. And as I say, the, most industries still don't want to use it, because you know you can't get away without uh, drag on a thick base. But you can. Now, so here is another case where studies of the flow phenomena allowed us to further improve things. All the way through this thing, the, one of the things that always irritates me is that it's been said that we arrived at the supercritical airfoil by cut and try. That is, well, we'll try a thousand things and maybe one of them will be good. It was try, but always trying to understand what the flow does. And then we get some sort of understanding on it, put it in the tunnel, and sometimes your understanding wasn't too good and it didn't work. But it always, before you go in, you had to have some reason why you were doing it. I'll start my story. After we developed the supercritical airfoil, then we started applying at the three-dimensional wings. And while the mixed flow at two dimensional is complicated, the mixed flow at three dimensions is even more complicated. You just added another dimension. But what we had a starting point. We put uh, supercritical airfoils on the outer panel where there wasn't much three-dimensional effect. And then we had to worry about what the three-dimensional flow is near the root. There's another factor that enters into the three-dimensional case, and that is that the boundary layer on three-dimensional wings is far more complicated than the boundary layer on two-dimensional wings. Because the span-wise pressure gradients tend to push the boundary layers along the span. And so we had to have some sort of device for studying the boundary layers on three-dimensional wings. And that particular device is a fluid oil flow that was developed by Sam Katzoff back oh, about 25 years ago. And we've been using it ever since. But in the development of uh, three-dimensional supercritical wings, it was, a it was very, very useful. And now I have shown here, this is, not, this is just to show you what the oil flow looks like. This happens to be 
a supercritical wing at a very high lift coefficient after the flow has stalled. And as you can see, uh, there's a very severe cross flow. This, the, you, the oil is, the whiteness here is where the oil is thick, and the boundary there is separated and is now sweeping outward towards the tip and actually sweeping forward all the way to the leading edge at this point. And that is typical in, of flow on a swept back wing beyond the separation point or where it stalls. There's nothing unique about a uh, supercritical wing in this regard. I'm just showing it this to you to indicate how the oil indicates massive boundary layer separation. But the oils can also, and this is where it was most useful, to show little tiny changes. Now, this is a uh, the, uh, supercritical airfoil, and it's one a high aspect ratio supercritical airfoil we developed for transports. And here is the oil flow study on that particular wing after we had arrived at the final configuration, when we'd gotten rid of all of the things we didn't like. So this is a nice, clean cruise condition. And you'll notice, let's see, what do we use for a pointer here? Here it is, right here. Now, this particular line right here is where we put the transition on, we fixed transition. A flow ahead of that point is laminar, and you can, the first thing that oil shows you is that we did get transition, because you can see all the little trans, transition wedges at, from that strip. The next thing it shows is that we do have a very weak pressure recovery uh, at this point where a shock wave will ultimately form. Right at this point, it is not a distinct wave, but it is a place where the gradients are building up. And we know we're getting close to a problem there. The third thing it shows is that because of the pressure recovery near the trailing edge, the boundary layer is all turning outward at this point. And that's, again, uh, typical of swept back wings. Everything about this, there's nothing wrong with this flow. It's, I'm just trying to use this picture to show you what the, the, the oil flow study is showing us. I want to point out also that while there is some accumula or accumulation of oil at this point, in near the root, there is none whatsoever. Now, we also are measuring pressure distributions at this point, and we know that there's a steep rise here, and we know that there's no steep rise here. I'm just trying to show that the oil can show you what the pressures show. <coughs> Now, we go up a little bit in lift coefficient, and we know from our force data that the, uh, we're now up the drag rise a little bit, about 10 counts. Not much, but it's up. And the other thing we know is from the pressure distribution is that we've developed a shock wave on the outboard panel. And now you can see those in the oils. See that very severe accumulation of oil right there? That's very abrupt change in direction. That's a shock. The other thing, and far more important from a drag standpoint, is that the boundary layer is separated now, right in this region right here. Again, not much, 10 counts of drag. But when you're dealing with, a con uh, with transport configurations, you worry about 10 counts of drag. There's a saying, I remember uh, well, we were working with industry at this point, and so I went to the, uh, at one point I was talking about all we got was 10 counts of drag out of that improvement. And somebody said, we'll sell our grandmother for 10 counts of drag. Because it's important that they get the highest possible, possible efficiency. So little things do count. So well, you say, well, why don't you do something about this? Well, we've we, done as much as we could. We've now, this lift coefficient is way up. And so uh, we, uh, this is finally a point where you say, well, that is as far as we can go. But I use this picture just to show you that it indicated when we had a problem. <coughs> After we had uh, fully developed a supercritical wing, in contrast to an airfoil, that is all of three-dimensional work, uh, 
And we already had the area rule from a number of years back. We, we thought that maybe what we ought to try to do is develop a transport configuration that could fly very close to the speed of sound. Catchphrase, I called it a sonic transport, even though it only flew at nine, it was only supposed to fly at 98% of the speed of sound. Now here was a case where we were, I was going to use every tool that I developed over a career in order to arrive at something which I considered to be an optimum airplane. Push up to the speed of sound as close as you can. Because as R.T. Jones has already pointed out, as soon as you go supersonic, the L over, D's, L over D's fall off dramatically. And therefore, keep the L over D's at a good subsonic level, but push the speed up just as far as you can. And so we worked at that, and this is the configuration we arrived at. Now, this wing is uh, a supercritical airfoil, and it's uh, a lot of work was done to get this root section so we didn't have any shock waves, but the new addition is a very deeply indented fuselage. And one of the manifestations of the application of the area rule is an indented or Coke bottle shaped fuselage, as I had mentioned earlier. Now, after we had worked quite a while on this, we knew we had the wing right. And we'd applied the aerial rule rigorously, and yet, when we, at, at zero lift, which the aerial rule, aerial rule was intended for, there was no shock waves, and we got a beautiful drag rise, no drag rise, all the way out to about 98% of the speed of sound. But when we increased the lift up to the cruise value, we got a drag rise. And we looked at the Schlieren pictures, and we had a shock wave standing on the configuration up here, right about at this point. Right in there, all the way across here. And this stopped us, because remember, the, 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 the data obtained at zero lift it indicate we'd gotten rid of the wave. So there must be something additional happening at this Mach number due to lift. And I sweated that one out. And finally it dawned on it. We were dealing with a supercritical airfoil. And a supercritical airfoil has supersonic flow on the upper surface, a good region of it, in fact. And when you go to supersonic speeds, the stream tubes expand. Remember I mentioned earlier that the stream tubes contract at subsonic speeds. They stay at a constant value near the speed of sound, but the tubes expand at supersonic speeds. So that on the upper surface of the wing, outside the, that supersonic region, the air is being pushed outward more than the physical geometry of the model. In other words, there's an additional push due to that supersonic region. Now, uh, I think you're all aware of the fact that when you build a supersonic tunnel, you have to expand the tunnel out. Be, uh, you go through a minimum and then out to a uh, bigger section behind the minimum because of the stream tubes. And here's a case where the same thing is happening. The stream tubes are pushing out on the flow beyond the stream tubes. And therefore, the configuration is acting like a body with more cross-sectional area. So what we've got to do is indent for that additional cross-sectional area. So what we did is make some calculations on the basis of our pressure distributions to determine how much that expansion was and take that out. Now, here is a cross-sectional area distribution first for a body of revolution with a minimum drag at 98% of the speed of sound. That had been worked out on another test. And so that was our basic envelope distribution. And of course, in addition to that, uh, th there was an indentation into that, as you saw from the picture. But the basic envelope distribution has to be indented from this down to this because due to allow for that expansion of stream tubes. Then, of course, the, the physical act indentation due to the, the geometry of the airplane makes it much deeper. It comes way in here. But this is an additional piece that has to be taken out. We did that, and the shock at lifting conditions disappeared. 
and we did not have a drag rise at the cruise lift coefficient to 98% of the speed of sound. So here again was a case where a study of the physical phenomena led to an improvement in the airplane. Well now, nobody's seen any of these near sonic transports around, just as you all know, you haven't seen any with R.T. Jones's uh, yard skewed wing, that is production airplanes, and I, it'll be quite a while before you'll see any uh, near sonic transports, because just about the time we finish work on that, the Arabs quadrupled the price of oil. And while the, the airplane had the same L over Ds as uh, the, at a lower speed, there was no loss in efficiency like SSTs have, at this particular point, the industry said, we don't want to fly faster. We want to fly with the lowest fuel consumption possible. Because at that particular point, the percentage of their direct operating costs it used to be they didn't worry too much about fuel, but suddenly fuel was 40% of their operating costs. So we switched all of our work to try and getting higher L over Ds, and the obvious approach there was to go to higher aspect ratios. We went to thicker supercritical wings with higher aspect ratios, and the work on the near sonic transport just got put in the files. We did put some reports on it, but it was, it was ironic because at that point, the Boeing had designers laying out real airplanes that looked like that model I showed you. But they again scrapped those drawings just like we scrapped our research. We had three models ready to go, which were never tested. But then we tested all kinds of different high aspect ratio wings using the approach that I've already described to you, the oil flow studies, to get the highest possible lift to drag ratios. Now, as part of this whole program on trying to get the highest possible lifted drag ratios at high subsonic speeds, we came up with an idea which we called winglets. And as you'll see as you go through this thing, I very emphatically cannot accept other terms for it. Now, way, way back to, to start with, Lanchester in about the turn of the century, it was about 1898, wrote a textbook, and it was, had brilliant insights in it, and he described the flow around the tip of the wing and said you could probably reduce this flow by putting a vertical surface at the tip. It's not a new idea. In fact, remember, the Wright brothers didn't fly until after the turn of the century, so this was before the Wright brothers. Now, about the 1920 or so, the theoreticians got at it and they calculated how much you could gain by putting a vertical surface at the tip. Now, uh, to, I hope that I don't uh, insult any theoreticians, but they always simplify things, and one of the simplifications theoreticians have been make, make, doing for years in, boundary layer, in uh, aerodynamics is assuming there's no boundary layer. And if you don't have a boundary layer, then you can put these things out at the tip and they'll work nicely. But what they call them, and here's the key, uh, the, the, uh, semantics are something that, to behold. They call them end plates. And from a purely theoretical standpoint, they could put plates there and they'd work. In real life, plates won't work. But at least 15 experimentalists tried these things at the tips of the wings, and because the theoreticians had called them plates, they put plates at the tip. Nobody stopped to think about what the real flow did. And believe me, none of them worked. Because let's, let's go into what has to happen. When you put that vertical surface at the tip, it has to carry a side load if it's going to have any effect on the lift to drag ratio. And to carry a side load, that is to, to, uh, uh, to lift vector turn sideways. And I've got a picture, yeah, you see that? You've got to have a vector lift there like that. To do that, you have to treat this surface as if it were a wing. You have to design it with an efficient airfoil. And in particular, it's got to have a leading edge radius on the thing. And it's got, but more, to make it even better, you have to have some camber in it. And also, 
and this is not absolutely essential, you'll get the best results by tilting the thing so that it turns outward towards the, the, the flow. All of these things had to be built in. Now let's go into, when we did it, we got a very substantial reduction in drag due to lift. But now let's go through what's happening here. The, uh, this, uh, this is a picture. I said that these are vertical surfaces at the tip. And we put another little one down here. Let's ignore that. It works just like the upper one. But let's talk about this one. It's a wing and it's got taper, it's got camber, it's got it tilted, uh, the leading edge is inward, it's about four degrees from the outboard point. And now what happens is that the, there's a cross flow up out at the uh, tip of the wing. It's inward on the upper surface and outward on the lower surface. And when you put this lifting surface here on the upper surface, then you get this vector here, and the lifting surface turns the flow in this direction, as any lifting surface does. It turns the flow. And so the flow is now doesn't have as much twist in it, and we get less drag due to lift. I usually use a picture of the vortices that are behind a wing, but I assume that you're all familiar with the vortices that are behind wings. Uh, now, the, 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 how does it reduce drag? Well, usually the vector of lift is approximately normal to the stream direction, and the stream direction has an inward tilt to it. And so, therefore, the lift has this forward vector, and it has a thrust on it. The, the, there's a component of that vector that has, is, has thrust. And so you get a reduction in the drag. Fundamentally, the reason we get it is because we've reduced the energy loss in the wing. Now, I, I want to point out why wing, uh, plates didn't work, because you could never develop the forward vector on the thing because they were just flat plates lined up with the airstream. So we worked out the winglets on a number of airplanes. And again, we used the oil flow studies that I described earlier to develop refined winglets. That is, in almost every case, there was interference in the boundary layer between, on the winglet and on the wing, which we had, to, we had to reduce in order to get the gains that we wanted. Again, worrying about what the boundary layer is doing. <coughs> that is about uh, the story. I've tried to show that by always considering what the flow phenomena is, whether it be using other people's data, considering the fundamentals, or going into the tunnel and getting some new data, only by this approach can one solve the problems of the, or solve your particular problems, particularly at transonic speeds. And now that we have the, people are, somebody's going to say, well, now we've got the high-speed computers, and they're spewing out answers for us, and we don't have to worry about airflow anymore. Ah, yes, we do. Because most of those theories blow up in your face as soon as you get some separation on the airplane, and you still have to know what the boundary layer is doing, whether it's separated or not separated. And in addition, even if you had <coughs> A perfect theory, a perfect model you put in the, in the computer, the computer is still only a tool, just like the wind tunnel was back in the days when you didn't have computers. The computer does not think. There are many, many aeronautical engineers that think the computers think. They don't. You put in what your input is, and it spews out an answer. And uh, I don't know whether any computer people here, but they've got a classic story, and it should be repeated. It, it should be a sign up on any theoretician's wall. Garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> and there's too many cases where people just have trusted the computer implicitly. I, I've got to tell this story, because it, it, it's a classic. <laughs> 
with regard to telling people that use computers they still got to think. Uh, I had a guy come in one time and he showed me a results of his, his computer output and on a new airplane he was proposing. And I said, that configuration stinks. <laughs> he says, it can't be. I got it out of the computer. I says, but the computer is telling you it stinks. Because he, he couldn't look, he wouldn't look at the pressure distribution in the computer and see a tremendously strong shock wave. So the, the computer can tell you when there's a shock wave there, but don't just take the gospel, look at it. Just like I've been looking at wind tunnel data for many decades. Okay, well, again, that was, that was the, I just want to point out we still have to think. Okay, that's the, it, and I guess we're supposed to open this thing for questions. Financial uh, information about the problems of high-speed flight, things that I hadn't even heard about when I was back in school, about the compressibility burble, that's what they called it in those days, and all of the very severe drag stability and uh, control problems that you, we had at transonic speeds, low transonic speeds. And there was no way to predict these things. It was totally, uh, you couldn't calculate because it was totally mixed up flow. It, the big problem was that it was a mixture of part subsonic and part supersonic flow with a very large amount of separation thrown in. So in order to be able to figure out how to improve things, we had to understand the flow. Since there's no theory, we had to, what I did so immediately, very shortly after I got there, was to say, let's go into the tunnel and study what's going on. We ran many tests that, show, that showed we had a problem, but why did we have the problem? Now, the two-dimensional two airfoil test uh, showed us something about that case, but we knew very little about the three-dimensional case. At about the time I got there, or a couple of years after I got there, uh, the, uh, we got the data from the Germans on swept back wings, and also uh, R.T. Jones proposed swept back wings during that period. Here again was a case where the simple theory told us that we were going to get a lot out of the uh, swept back wing, but in reality, when we tested a these various swept back wings, we didn't get anywhere near what the theory predicted. So we had to find out what was going on. And so throughout When I first arrived at Langley, back during World War II, I was assigned to the branch that included the eight-foot high-speed tunnel. It wasn't a transonic tunnel in those days. And John Stack was in charge. Of course, working for John Stack was an experience, but that's not part of my story. Uh, the, what I learned immediately, a lot of comp also we can determine where the drag's coming from by wake surveys. And also we can put, we, at that time, we put tufts on the surface to f uh, show uh, roughly what the boundary layer is doing. Now, from these results that I got on a series of wings, swept back and swept forward, we found out why the theory, uh, why the actual wing did not would act as well as the theory predicted. And it was due to the fact that the 
sweep of the shock wave on the upper surface of the wing was not as great as the sweep back of the wing, and therefore it was just acting like a wing with lower sweep back. Over the years, the various people that uh, design airplanes have accounted for that by putting very severe variations in the section across the span to uh, keep the... Uh, th this was the first case that I got involved with, but throughout the rest of the, the, the time that I worked at the tunnel, we were continually exploring the phenomena that was involved with transonic flight. It's only been in the last few years that we've gotten some of the theories that we need to allow us to rationally pr predict what's going to happen at transonic speeds. Now, the, I mentioned that the, the first thing that I got involved with was the swept back wing. I proposed that we study the flow around a swept back wing. And we used all of our available uh, flow measuring devices. The basic one is uh, surface pressure measurements. 